Welcome everybody. Welcome to, to University of Hampton. If, you, if you're not from here, welcome to Frober College. This is a room uh, filled with Frobelian's uh, past. So we have all the buildings of Frobel are named after most of the, the people, women, and a couple of men uh, in this room. Uh, so we're very proud of our history here at the University of Hampton. We have um, we are formed of four teaching training colleges which came together in the 1970s um, under the threat of not being allowed to educate teachers anymore because they were too small and the, the um, it's just actually didn't like that. So they come together, created the Frobel Institute, uh, Rehampton Institute of Education, and now we're part of a much larger university, University of Rehampton. Uh, but we're still the heart of university. Education is what the University of Rehampton, I feel, is about. And, um, and we're here to, to pay... Um, welcome and goodbye. There's an inaugural and a valedictory, and if my A little Latin and then go by, um, Wale is, is well and Dicare is to speak. So we're going to say farewell. We're going to say farewell with you um, delivering a lecture for us. Um, my name is Peter Flew, I'm Director of School of Education. So my job is to give professors everything they need to do the best job they can. That's good. There's no concept of hierarchy here. There's no way I can be in charge of Debbie. That uh, really, really <laughs> wouldn't work at all. So, uh, Professor Debbie Epstein, um, uh, I'll just have a short biography here, and then uh, Sarah Flynn, Deputy Director, will, will introduce uh, her research. So, uh, Debbie left South Africa uh, six months after starting a VA. That's, that's a bit you know, presumptuous, you didn't quite finish it, but you managed to come over to England and finish it in Sussex, uh, so VA in history. Um, and then, research assistant at University College London, and then 17 years as a teacher, part-time or full-time, uh, ending up um, as head of infants at Barncroft School in Hertfordshire. Um, then, having got a bit bored of being a head teacher, moving on to an advisory capacity, so teacher advisor for race quality in Birmingham, starting a PhD, which was completed in 1991, and then moved into the Department of Sociology at the University of Central England, 91 to 94, and at the Institute of Education in London from September 1994 to May 2001. Um, promoted many times to be professor and chair of the academic board. Another two years at Goldsmiths, and then as professor head of the department, and then <coughs> professor of education at Cardiff School of Social Sciences. Uh, Debbie joined Rohampton in 2013 um, with a part-time post, and we're very proud that she's going to be talking to us today. Sarah. Thank you. Ah. This is Shall I start reading Debbie's slides? <laughs> um, it's such a privilege to stand up here today and speak about Debbie. I have known her for many years. I think I first met her probably in 1998 at the Institute of Education when I was doing my MA. And like many other people, she supported me through a master's dissertation and then through my PhD. Um, and she's been, she was a wonderful PhD tutor, and it's lovely to see some of her current and former uh, students are here this evening. Um, unfortunately, many of those who wanted to attend could not, owing in part to, uh, to us, really, and to the very short notice that went out. Now, I couldn't possibly read out all the um, messages because there were so many of them that came in, but I would just like to read out just a few of them. So uh, one is from Becky Francis, um, Director of the Institute of Education at University College London, who says, I'm very sorry. I should have loved to have attended Debbie's valedictory event, given her enormous contribution to the field, but I have prior external event commitment that evening. It is unfortunately short notice. Hopefully there may, may be another opportunity to celebrate her work, and I'm sure there may well be many opportunities. Professor Jill Valentine from uh, Sheffield University. I would have loved to come to Debbie's valedictory lecture, but sadly it was a bit too short notice for me, as I'm currently Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Lucky her. So I have very little diary flexibility. I'm very sorry I can't be there. Please, can you let me have Debbie's address? So I can send her a card. Professor Valerie Walkerdine, not that I'll quake in my boots, but she was my Viva super, uh, Viva. Um, 
What a very great shame for the incredibly short notice. I can't get there from Wales on that date, but I would have loved to have come. Huge apologies to Debbie. And then um, <clears throat> Professor Kathleen Richardson from um, De Montfort. And she's Professor of Ethics and Culture of Robots and Artificial Intelligence. We do know some people. <laughs> Thank you for this kind invitation, and I thought I could intend, attend, but unfortunately the date now clashes with an important EU project meeting. So they are still going on, EU project meetings. Please send my apologies and wish Professor Epstein the best and an acknowledgement of her important work. Uh, and then Marilyn Strathern, uh, I should say Dame Marilyn Strathern, uh, Professor of Social Anthropology at Cambridge. I'm so pleased to see that Debbie is giving her lecture and only very sorry that I shall be away. Comes with best wishes, wishes for what promises to be a wonderful occasion. A um, couple more, just two more very quickly. Professor Irem Siraj, Professor of Child Development and Education at Jesus College, Oxford. I'd love to be there but I am in Australia. Uh, please pass on my regards and good wishes. And finally, the wonderful Helen Rowlands, uh, editor of, of, um, editorial manager of Gender and Education, who gave us a lot of help, actually, when we did the Gender and Education Conference here a few years ago, um, and then published the special issue journal. Uh, thank you so very much for the invitation. Unfortunately, next Tuesday I have work commitments and won't be able to make it to London. I'll email Debbie now to let her know. Hope all's well. All the best, Helen. So, and there were many more messages. It went on and on. Um, uh, I don't think I've had so many emails from so many important people in my inbox. Um, but anyway, so... And Debbie's work output is prolific and important, but she once told me that schooling sexualities was the work she was most proud of. I don't know if that's still the case. Uh, because she felt in it, she said, something really new that had not been said before. And this work was written with Richard Johnson, director of Birmingham's famous Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies, after Stuart Hall, who was the previous director, where Debbie worked for some time. Schooling sexualities traced how schools actually did school sexualities. And at the time, no one was really demonstrating this. Set within cultural studies, the cultural world of education and the microcultural worlds of children, young people and teachers, it showed how sexuality was present everywhere in schools, how it permeated pedagogies, curriculums, allowing and disallowing sexualities in different educational spaces. Sexuality was not, as many had thought at the time, something you were born with, or something that schools simply dealt with in sex education and biology lessons. It's a brilliant read. Um, I recommend it. Debbie's work sits in cultural studies, which is her love, but she has written in the areas of race, gender, and most recently about elite schools. Threading through all her work, and indeed her life, is a passionate commitment to issues of social justice. And that might be expected from someone who had to leave South Africa at 17 because of her protest against apartheid. And I looked at her Facebook page the other night, as I, said, as I sometimes do, and she's still fighting for those causes that she believes in. So the pictures of Debbie on various demonstrations. Activism for causes is as important as academia and Debbie is no ivory tower academic. So at some point, I guess she may well end up arrested on a demonstration. And I guess that probably won't be the first time that's ever happened. It would. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Her most recent to avoid it up to now. Well, well, well I, I don't think you can avoid it much longer. <laughs> Her most recent work, Class Choreographies, Elite Schools and Globalisation, um, won the Comparative and International Education Society's Best Book Prize. It's a multi-sided ethno ethnographic study spread over five continents and uh, uh, looking at the world's elite public schools. And this was done with her great colleague, Jane Kenway, and with a team of uh, uh, four... Six people. Six people, yeah. 
it doesn't just observe and interact with the pupils, parents and teachers in these schools, but also, for example, with the gardeners and the cleaners and the people normally rendered invisible in such school studies. It explores the institutionalisation of power relationships and how these are globalised. Working as the project lead with Jane Kenway and the team, based in England, Australia, India, South Africa and the Caribbean, the study is innovative both in its methodology and indeed in the tracing of power across continents in the making of the influence of the 1% across the globe. Behind global capitalism are these schools, and in these schools, these young people are prepared to be our world leaders. It's a fascinating, if not somewhat chilling read. I have an inkling of what Debbie is going to speak about tonight, and it will be thought-provoking. It always is when Debbie speaks, and it will be passionate, and it will almost certainly tackle an issue of social justice. So I commend to you Professor Debbie Epstein. Thank you. Well, how to follow that and how to live up to it. So I always ask my doctoral students, those of them who have been my doctoral students and those of you who are here, to do um, what, I, what Jane Miller told me about, which she used to call the autobiography of the question. Uh, that should, that's normally their first piece of written work. So in the spirit of doing so, of doing as I say, I begin by putting myself in the picture, which is also something that we always made the first year students in cultural studies do. The photographs on the slide are the places where I grew up. My childhood home, you can see in the middle, uh, Pretoria, where we lived, with its beautiful jacarandas uh, and the purple, the purple city, beautiful Cape Town and the Kruger National Park and Durban, up at left where my grandparents lived. I benefited in material ways from apartheid. People here always say apartheid and in the, and in the United States as well, but it's easy to remember. Apart, H-A-T-E, apartheid. Um, I was and I benefited in, in material ways from white supremacy. I was and am privileged not only white, but with professional parents, though my mother was precluded from working by the marriage bar at that time, and who had both social capital and a good family income. I grew up with black servants in the house, but I was also the daughter of liberal left-wing parents who opposed apartheid, apartheid, uh, you get, got, me, got me saying it now, as commie Jews, which is a phrase imbued with anti-Semitism in South Africa where racism was institutionalised. These are a few examples, and there could have been so many more, of how different the lives of black South Africans were at the time. We've got the Sharpeville Massacre uh, from March 1960, and I came to the UK in 1962 and have lived here, here ever since. The massacre was a police response to a demonstration at Sharpeville against the hated passes that Africans had to carry at all times to show whether they had permission to live in the so-called white areas. The dead child is Hector Peterson. He is the first child photographed, not the first child who died, in the 1976 student uprisings. And he's been carried by Mbuyisa Makuba, who disappeared, or was disappeared, thereafter. I met his mother in 2012, and she still didn't know what had happened to him, whether he was alive or dead. Hector's sister is running next to him. The picture on the top left is of miners, they came to Johannesburg, the city of gold, Egoli, um, for work, and very hard work. 
at that. They lived in crowded hospital, hostels, not hospitals, away from their families. At the bottom right is, is uh, your left, my right. Um, is, that's the clinic that my father used to volunteer at as a young doctor. The only white doctor in Pretoria who would agree to work at the clinic, volunteer. And he, if you can see, there's a man in a wheelbarrow there. And uh, my father used to say, he's, he's being brought here in a wheelbarrow because there are no ambulances in the, in the black townships. The beware of natives notice. Wow, what does that tell us? It, says some, it shows us a lot about the fear and loathing of black people that was institutionalised in legislation in South Africa at the time. As, as does the bench, which is labelled Europeans, blunkers, blunkers means whites. So apartheid was a system that dehumanised and depersonalised African people and other minorities who were, in Mary Douglas's terms, polluting and dangerous, seen as polluting and dangerous. So there I was, born in 1945, a Jewish child immediately after the Holocaust, left-wing feminist parents and grandparents in a racist, anti-Semitic country. And I was introduced and educated in politics very early. I accompanied my mother when it was her turn in a rota of liberal women to feed the prisoners in the treason trial which began in Pretoria in 1956 when I was 11. In 1957, she took me with her when she went to give lifts to people, black people, who were walking the long distances between the African township outside Pretoria, which serviced Pretoria, in the big bus boycott of 1959. Sorry, in the big bus boycott, that was 57. In 1959, I was taken to my first formal political meeting by my mum, who thought it would be educative for me, as indeed it was, to hear a talk by the then leader of the African National Congress, Chief Albert Latouli. But whatever our political convictions and commitment, it is clear that no one can escape privilege. Just like the well-known white heroes of the South African struggle, such as Joe Slovo and Ruth First, we could not identify out of whiteness. So given my background, it's not really surprising that I've always been politically on the left and that my main interest in research and teaching has always been in inequalities, what holds them in place, how can they be combated. And growing up in South Africa taught me a lot about inequalities and the dangers of basing politics entirely on identity rather than on material conditions and about the particular problems that arise when groups or individuals identify as victims regardless of material reality. It is especially dangerous when these groups and individuals, who may well have been victimised but may not, um, come from powerful groups. Sorry. Or, or, sorry. Those who are, in, who are in powerful groups now see themselves as still victims, even though this is not their material reality. In the big politics, that was the case in South Africa, and to some extent still is, and is currently the case in Israel. We also see it in the rise of misogyny, racism and fascism, and the growth of authoritarian populism across the world. So, the, in the next section, I begin by drawing on Stuart Hall's writings about identity and identification before going on to refer to my work with Richard Johnson on children's identities. I then point to some problems with theorising inequality through intersectionality, proposing that Stuart Hall's theory of articulation and conjuncture are more useful, both for for, for understanding inequalities. Then I return to some of my early work with young children to discuss the idea of informed consent, especially for children, and what this means in the context of current identity politics, 
and sex slash gender. My final section explores, explores possible reasons, briefly, why universities are finding it so difficult to support academic freedom in the current context. Stuart Hall argues that the concept of identification is preferable to that of identity. Identification, he says, is a process of articulation. I'm going to come back to that. He continues, it requires what is left outside, its constitutive outside, to consolidate the process. In other words, identities need their others in order to be felt as solid. In his wonderful posthumously published memoir, Familiar Stranger, Life Between Two Islands, which I do really recommend you to read, whatever your interests are, he explores these ideas in relation to his own life. He explains how he came to understand the shifting nature of identity. And this is what he said. I will read it because it's a bit um, dense. Contrary to common sense understanding, the transformations of self-identity are not just a personal matter. Historical shifts out there provide the social conditions of existence of personal and psychic changes in here. What mattered was how I, that Stuart, positioned myself on the other side or positioned myself to catch the other side. How I was involuntarily hailed by and interpolated into a broader social discourse. Only by discovering this did I begin to understand that what black identity involved was a social, political, historical, and symbolic even. There shouldn't have been an A there. Not just a personal and not simply a genetic one. Certainly not simply a genetic one. And he goes on, we tend to think of identity as taking us back to our roots, the part of us which remains essentially the same across time. In fact, identity is always a never completed process of becoming, a process of shifting identifications rather than a singular, complete state of being. So if all identities are always shifting and never complete, children's identities are even more likely to change as they become more experienced and mature actors in the world. Richard Johnson and I suggested, and this is a quote, young people produce themselves as gendered, sexualized, and racialized actors in and through certain key relationships. Their most immediate contexts are the cultures of young people, themselves formed in relation to institutional sites such as schools, commercial popular culture, including social media, and household and family relationships. We understand identity here not as something that is given by anatomy, or genes, or even psychosocial development, but as something that is produced by hard work and active performance. Of course, this self-production occurs in conditions that young people do not control. Identity is, not only, is about not only who one wants to be, who one wants to be with, who one wants to be like, who one wants to be liked by, but also who one wants to be different from, who one dislikes, who makes one gag, who is one's other. Marx said, men make history, but he does not make it out of the whole cloth. He does not make it out of conditions chosen by himself but out of such as he finds close at hand. So too with identities. We make our identities, but not in conditions of our own choosing. And we make them, as Richard Johnson and I argued, out of the resources available to us, which change over time. Identities, identifications are not fixed, but over time, when constantly repeated in one's stories to oneself and others about oneself and others, there is a tendency for them to solidify in part, but they never stop needing work in the form of reinforcement taken from others and from the stories we tell ourselves in trying to find new ways of occupying the identities, in finding new identities and so on. As Hall puts it, identity in the singular is never achieved with any finality. Identities in the plural are means of becoming. My own life illustrates this. Some threads are constant like my lifelong activism, feminism and opposition to oppression. Others are not. Politically engaged, active and engaged early, 
I nevertheless left South Africa in 1962 at the age of 16, 17 and didn't return until 1995, one year after the first democratic elections. So my identification is now both fully South African and completely British, and simultaneously neither fully South African nor completely British. After all this time, I'm fully engaged and care about what happens in and to Britain, yet I feel deeply South African. In terms of sexuality, I was in a heterosexual marriage for 15, 15 years, had two daughters, who are of course both wonderful and political in their different ways, coming out as a lesbian at the time of the Stop the Clause campaign. But a big recent change in my identifications came when I almost died in 2011 with the onset of an incurable autoimmune disease, which can be managed, and as you can see, I'm doing pretty well, but not cured. This interpolates, that is, calls to me, into yet another identification with chronic illness and chronic pain. So I want to give you a warning here, and myself, that identity politics are dangerous. If we all have identities and work at them, even if not conscious of that work, why do I claim that identity politics are dangerous? These photos demonstrate some of these dangers vividly. The skulls and other bones come from the Rwandan genocide, whose prequel included straight propaganda requiring Tutsis as cockroaches. We've heard something similar in the not too distant part from Katie Hopkins. Then there's the wall, the, the Israeli wall that divides Palestinians from Israelis. And there are figures from the far right, from the UK, the US, Hungary and Italy. The two that you might not know the faces of are Salvini and Orban. The appeal of these politicians is based entirely on identity politics. The politics that come about when particular identities are regarded as static, ahistorical and the very essence of one's personhood. And the fault lines in British politics and in everyday life, from Brexit and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia to trans rights, are solidly based on essentialist identities. Gayatri Spivak coined the phrase strategic essentialism in 1988, advocating, well, a bit earlier than that, but in the 1980s, advocating the strategic use of essentialism, deploying essentialist politics to fight oppression. I have problems with this, as indeed does Spivak herself. As early as 1989, she said she no longer wanted to use it. And in an interview in 1993, she explained, when in the United States the statement, the personal is political, came into being, it really became quite quickly, only the personal is political. In the same way, my notion, my, my notion just simply became a union ticket for essentialism. As to what it is meant by strategy, no one wondered about that. Something similar has happened wherever her term is popular, as it is. As a result, difference, oppression and dominance have become individualised, which fits very well with the hegemony of neoliberal politics. People are seen to be and are represented as individually responsible for what happens to them. Material and reality-based politics, albeit experienced and illustrated through individual lives, have all but disappeared from discourse. When the slogan was adopted, then the slogan personal is political was adopted by second wave feminism, feminists, the idea of consciousness raising groups was emphatically not that we would just get together to tell stories of our own lives in a supportive group, although we did that. On the contrary, our narratives were heuristic to help us developing an understanding of the structural inequalities between the sexes that existed then, and to a very large extent, continue to exist. Our individual stories of lower pay, sexual and sexist harassment and violence, and discrimination of all kinds at home, in public places and at work, helped us to develop analyses of the gendered cultures in which we live in terms of power differentials between the sex classes, male and female, women and men. 
In other words, at that time, the experience of individuals was not what made us identify as feminists, but the material facts of women's existence within different patriarchal systems. That is, systems that systematically disadvantaged and penalised women in ways nuanced by class, race, ethnicity, nationality, citizenship, sexuality and so on. These were historically and geopolitically grounded. A similar case could be made by the, about the development of black politics. However, as Hall argues, quote, the essentializing moment is weak because it naturalizes and dehistoricizes difference, mistaking what is historical and cultural for what is natural, biological and genetic. The moment the signifier of black is torn from its historical, cultural and political embedding and lodged in a biologically constituted racial category, we valorise by inversion the very ground of racism we are trying to deconstruct. So what I'm arguing is that going down the essentialist route sets up a situation in which splitting off from others, depersonalising and dehumanising them becomes increasingly common, potentially leading to occasions like the Rwanda genocide. <coughs> now, this is not a problem uh, it's solved by intersectional theory. Like strategic essentialism, intersectionality has become a uni union ticket for progressivism. The term is often used without thought as a kind of mantra. You've got to be intersectional. There has, however, been a lot of interesting work in recent years to give the term a historical edge. And in the written form, I've given some references. But at its core, and indeed in Crenshaw's original work, the metaphor is individualising and static. If you Google inter intersectionality, you see both these tendencies at work. The one at, at the bottom on the left is actually Crenshaw's own from her tech talk given as late as October 2016. Cars may, or sometimes may not, move at intersections, but the intersections themselves are static, and the metaphor is of being stuck in the middle of stationary roads, waiting to be run over. In, in the, in the um, Crenshaw diagram by racism along one, one road and sexism along the other. And the term has also been captured by global capitalist bodies, such as Davos and the World Bank, which tells us something about the concept's malleability and, I think, should lead us to question its easy use. So, drawing on the work of Gramsci and Althusser, articulation theory, as developed by Hall, seeks to understand social formations as articulated structures, in other words, as connected systems of power, dominance and subordination. The metaphor here is of a joining, like an articulated lorry, in which two or more parts are joined and move in relation to each other, but can be both disarticulated and rearticulated in different ways. Each rearticulation differs, as articulations are dependent on historical and geopolitical circumstances. I personally have found this approach more helpful in theorising and understanding inequalities, how they are produced and sustained than intersectionality, and therefore better for activism, even though it's a bit harder. In my last big project on elite schools, when we came to analysing our South African data in particular, we turned to articulation theory for its power to help our, us understand a society in rapid transition with very complex uh, relations of power, a situation in which intersectionality was not helpful. Hall explains, by the term articulation, I mean a connection or link which is not necessarily given in all cases, as a law or a fact of life, but which requires particular conditions of existence to appear at all, which has to be positively sustained by specific processes, which is not eternal, but has to be constantly renewed, which can, under some circumstances, disappear or be overthrown, leading to the old linkages being dissolved and new connections, re-articulations being forged. 
Such circumstances, he calls conjunctures. Hall's race, race articulation in society structured in dominance was a significant analysis of race and class during apartheid. It was published in 1980. So articulation theory has never been taken up as widely as intersectionality. Perhaps it's harder to get your head round, I don't know. But its key strength for theorising social forces, powers and inequalities is precisely the, the complexity of articulated social structures and ideologies that, that it pays attention to. It holds us to giving historicised account that pay, pay attention to the specificities of structures, ideologies, discourse, economics and geopolitics in relation to each other in particular countries and at particular times. Conjunctures then are periods which can be long or short during which change is possible but neither predictable nor always progressive or retrogressive. When inherent contradictions come to a head and are in a crisis, as at present in this and other countries, that's a conjunctural moment or period in which articulated social structures can be disarticulated and rearticulated, but not in, in inevitable ways. So this gives me to the question of children, consent and identity. I've spoken a little about children's identities, but to reiterate, like those of adults, they are not fixed, which of course doesn't mean that there are no continuities. As adults, we may remember them as fixed, but it's accepted in cognitive psychology that memories of events are not reliable reproductions of the facts, but recreated, relived in relation to present needs. I hope the psychologists sitting here think that that's correct. Um, we all reinterpret our memories to make sense of where we are now. Given that identities are never complete, we cannot take retrospective accounts of childhood identities as reliable. There's a way in which all history is the history of the present. That is, it's always researched and written from a contemporary perspective. We make sense of historical events in terms of current identities, of current experience rather. So too with personal histories. We tell stories to ourselves about ourselves and stories to others about ourselves which help us understand where and who we are. And other people tell us stories about who we are too. In the new sociology of childhood, which is not new anymore, it's been around for a long time, in the new sociology of childhood, it is accepted that children have agencies or actors in their own lives and we need to honour their agency. But we also need to recognise that their understandings, their ways of making sense of the world they find themselves in, are not mature and their decisions, beliefs and actions are not always wise. Children will inevitably change, that's partly the nature of childhood, and they may well regret earlier decisions. This does not mean, of course, that we shouldn't respect and honour children's desires, but we all need to suspend judgement about where these young identities will go in future, and we need to think about how we honour them um, appropriately. I've argued elsewhere that the very notion of informed consent is a chimera, not only in research, but in medical procedures too. It is an illusion to believe that consent can ever be fully informed, because outcomes and effects are not predictable, either in medicine or in social research, and sometimes unforeseen outcomes are catastrophic, as in the infamous drug tests held at Northwood Park Hospital in 2006, resulting in serious ongoing problems for six previously healthy young men who had no claim against the, either the drug firm or those carrying out the tests because, why, they had signed consent forms. At the best, the information of informed consent is partial, especially in the case of children. Are you a girl or are you a teacher? was a question asked me by a year five girl in a school where I was doing ethnographic research. When I said that I was neither, she explored other roles known to her in the context of school. 
student, are you a student teacher, are you an inspector, are you a governor? I had previously gone to great lengths, I thought, to explain to her class what I was doing in their school classroom and playground. And I had asked the children for their verbal consent to my research, which was freely, even excitedly, given. I, I used that particular moment to explore the limits of children's ability to, under, to consent to participating in something they didn't understand. Of course, gender identifications, like other forms of identity, may change, and the younger the person, the less stable they are likely to be. Even where parents try to avoid gendering their babies with regard to toys and clothes that are given them, for example, and how similar behaviours are described, sorry, with regard to toys and clothes that are given to them, and how similar behaviours by the babies um, are described as as gendered because, as, because of sex stereotypes, even though they're pretty much exactly the same. This is from the age of tiny, tiny, tiny. So it's not surprising then that sex stereotypes develop early, and even nursery age children, as I, I wrote about back in 95, have already developed sex-based stereotypes and hold them firmly. So in the 70s and 80s, I was one of the many feminist teachers who worked very hard to undo, to try to undo these damaging stereotypes and challenge institutional sexism in schools. In my research about masculinities, for example, I've shown how even prepudescent boys are often bullied and punished for gender non-conforming behaviours, while girls who are tomboys, or who used to be known as tomboys, are more likely to be allowed gender non-conformity without punishment until they hit puberty. That is, and that is the time when girls are now referred to gids or jids, I'm not sure, uh, the Gender Identity and Development Service in huge numbers. Now, when children of either sex behave in gendered non-conforming ways, there seems to be an assumption by many adults parents, teachers and others, and promoted by such groups as Mermaids and Stonewall, that they must be, or at the very least are very likely to be, trans. And there's an imperative to affirm these behaviours as identities, which are going to be fixed. As is well known, there has been an exponential rise in the number of children. Yeah. referred to GIDS. The reason for this, reasons for this are many and complex. Uh, David Bell, in his foreword to a forthcoming book, um, Inventing Transgender Children and Young People, gives some of them. But we very much need longitudinal cultural studies type and sociological research, both qualitative and quantitative in order to understand this is a set of social and cultural processes related to individual lives and in a, in, particular, in a particular conjuncture. However vehemently children believe something or identify in particular ways, they have neither the experience, understanding, nor maturity to make these important decisions with long-lasting effects. Their knowledge and ours is at best partial. So I'm alarmed about the ever-increasing number of children, particularly girls, being referred to the to GIDS. And it's been increasing year on year. And you can see how many there are. 11, 12, 13, 14, as, as these girls come into puberty. So, in 2014-15, there were 678 referrals. And by 2018-19, there were 2,590, of whom nearly two-thirds were girls. 308 children of 11 and, were 11 and under. 10 of them were aged 3 and 4. 
I'll say that again, 10 of them were aged 3 and 4. Of those over 11, the biggest cohorts were aged between 12 and 15, that is, at the onset of puberty. So we need to ask ourselves, what on earth is going on here? There are surely many cultural factors which we don't fully understand at work. There have been few studies, and none of them fully longitudinal, to help us understand what is going on. There has been a longitudinal study in Sweden, but that was of adults only. We haven't had a longitudinal study of children. So I repeat, we need both quantitative and careful long-term cultural study style in the tradition of Birmingham ethnographic research to better understand all the cultural and individual factors involved. So one of the, one of the factors is certainly uh, the idea that children who are gender non-conforming will commit suicide if they are not affirmed in their gender non-conformity as trans. This is just one example of the kind of factors that might be involved. One, one of the issues about, one of the reasons it seems to me that um, it's so powerful is that parents never want harm to come to their children. Wouldn't say never, but in nearly all cases want what's best for their children. And I suggest that the imperative to affirm even very young children as trans publicised through the often repeated slogan, do you want a dead son or a live daughter? Which has gained enormous political leverage and leverage in the popular and social media. Unlike, the, you know, it's, it's really everywhere. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in the subject, you can barely move without seeing it and it's been put forward to schools and to parents and advice given to them. So when similar claims were about the suicidality of young, or the suicide ideation, or suicidality of young lesbian and gay people in the UK was found by Trenchard and Warren in the 80s, uh, you know, it never got really any leverage in the same way or publicity. Of course, social media didn't exist then and Stonewall was only set up soon after that. So, the, there's the, in the campaigning materials from Stonewall and Mermaid, and in popular campaigning um, materials and social media, the claim that, quote, 48% of young people have made at least one suicide attempt in their lives as compared to 26% of cisgendered young people. And, you know, there was a survey that said this, but unfortunately, and again, I hope my cons colleagues will confirm this for me, you can't, it's not reliable, because it was based on a sample of only 27 young people. 27. One of the Quants people tell me, how many would you need for a, rel a reliable sample? Antonia. More than that. Thousands. Thousands. Okay. Compare this with what the Samaritans say about using and understanding suicide statistics. They say it's all, it's all about rates per 100,000. And then in... in big capital letters, it says, be careful of small groups and populations. The size of populations should be considered when looking at suicide rates. Smaller populations often produce rates that are less reliable as the rates per 100,000 are based on small numbers, or per 100. Stonewall also commissioned a study that involved a larger number of respondents and would therefore be more likely to be accurate, but again it wasn't, it was I think around 300. But the sample was self-selected and relied on self-reporting, which as we know is likely to lead to a skewed result. And there's no account in their report or in any published paper 
of the methodology they used. And they suggest that 45% of trans young people have made suicide attempts. And when, when the, um, the, the, the series Butterflies was put on, which showed a suicidal young boy, the um, Gender Identity Clinic, the Tavistock, um, responded to it. This is their public response. Suicidality, suicidality in young people attending the GIDS is similar to that of young people referred to child and adolescent mental health services. It is not helpful to suggest that suicidality is an inevitable part of this condition. And there's one study, uh, which I mentioned earlier, in Sweden, which was based over a long period, 1972 to 2003, involving 324 adults who had had sex assignment surgery in Sweden and a randomly selected sample, population so control sample matched by age and sex at birth. Their findings were that there were, quote, substantially higher rates of overall mortality, death from cardiovascular disease and suicide, suicide attempts and psychiatric hospitalizations in sex reassigned transsexual individuals compared to a healthy controlled population. So, in that case, it seems that transition didn't take away all the problems. And this doesn't tell us, because it was a study only of adults, what the outcomes are or might be for children and young people of social, medical or later surgical transition. Suicide, self-harm and suicidality always involve multiple complex factors. Samaritans advise people both not to oversimplify and urges them to, quote, remember that there is a risk of imitational behaviour due to over-identification. Vulnerable individuals may identify with the person who has died or with the circumstances in which the person took their own life. Now, every suicide is a tragedy, but in light of everything I've just said, it's surely irresponsible to continue with such claims. As I said earlier, there's a need for more research, and particularly for longitudinal work that follows young people who do and do not identify as trans from childhood through to adulthood. It will be a long time before such studies could possibly become available. And we owe it to children and young people to be more careful in what we do and say pending this. I suggest, therefore, that all of us, including trans activists and their allies, need to su suspend claims to know in advance what trans means in the lives of these young people, while valuing and celebrating their lives as lives, and working hard to end bullying, the bullying of and discrimination against all stigmatised groups, including gender non-conforming children and schools and beyond. Now, this next bit is the bit I really hope the Vice Chancellor would be here for, but he couldn't come. One would think, given that all I've said so far, that this topic would be widely discussed in the academy. Universities are, after all, places where we're supposed to ask difficult questions and try to answer them. And academic freedom, including the freedom to express unpopular opinions, was guaranteed by the Education Reform Act of 1988. One reason is self-censorship due to fear. And I'm guilty of this. Those of you who've read uh, my work, read it, will know that how bland the abstract for this talk is, was. I'm known, as you referred earlier, as someone who's not been afraid to raise controversial issues. And I've researched sensitive subjects, including sexuality. As an advisor for race equality in predominantly white schools, and as a researcher, I was called insane in the Daily Mail. <laughs> my first books and my PhD were about racism and whiteness in primary schools. Post-PhD, I was one of the first people to publish on questions of sexuality in education, and I think the first to talk about sexuality in early childhood and primary school education. Back then, I told my group of feminist doctoral students, Sarah was among them, uh, that it was relatively easy to be a world le leader 
when you are one of the first in a particular area. But I have been uncharacteristically nervous about discussing trans issues. Academics and others who have been brave before me, mostly but not only women, have suffered abuse, campaigns to get them sacked and boycotted when they ask questions and make critiques of various aspects. No platforming, closing down of meetings and conferences in universities. There's a conference at um, the Open University, which didn't happen, uh, and it was nothing to do with this. It was, remind me, Ren, it was about immigration. No, about the abolishment of imprisonment. The about, ab of about the abolition of imprisonment. And it was closed down. The Open University closed it, said it couldn't happen because of the amount of um, adverse, um, angry letters and emails that received and comments on social media about Richard Garside, who was who's the director of Criminal Justice... Centre for Crime and Justice Studies. The Centre for Crime and Justice Studies, and um, is, according to trans activists and allies, which I would say does not include all trans people by any means, as being a transphobe. You wouldn't think the Open University would do that. So it's no wonder in that context why many of us feel silenced and are or have been silent. Academic work has always also been censure, censored as a result of pressure and campaigns fueled by social media. The latest is on this slide which has, uh, I've, I've reproduced the tweet from one of the editors there, Heather Bunch called Evans. Um, and there was a petition that went to the publishers to get Michelle Moore, the other editor, uh, who's long been the editor of Disability and Society, which is one of the most respected journals in the field of, uh, of disability, to ask, them, ask Taylor and Francis to sack her from being editor, it's an unpaid job. Um, and they refused to do so. And so now there's a second petition going around in academic Facebook groups and to asking, asking the publishers to sack her. Sadly, universities have been slow to defend those under attack. Kathleen Stock, who has herself been under such attack, has published the anonymised responses of others. The many examples that she gives there include universities telling academics to be careful what they say and publish, universities writing a press release, distancing themselves from an academic's opinion, and so on. All too often in these accounts, neither UCU nor universities have been helpful. And in the case of a young doctoral student at another university, uh, recently, her uh, supervisor put out a public statement documenting how shamefully uh, the, un the university had behaved in, when she made a complaint about bullying, uh, again, because she was being bullied by a, a group of students, because she had chaired a meeting <coughs> by Women's Place UK organised by Women's Place UK, not at the university, but in the city centre. And so then there was this really full-on campaign against her. And as a result, she uh, was unable to make progress with her PhD, and she's missed the date for her upgrading, and she's a student from um, Columbia, I think, uh, and faces potentially losing her visa. Again, I ask myself and others, as well as her scholarship, again, I ask myself and others why this might be. And it's about bringing in the money. I've written previously about academic freedom and argued there that the marketisation of universities and the com commodification of knowledge or antithetical to academic freedom. Students now have to pay large sums of money for higher education, 
and universities are reliant on their fees for a very large part of their income. Universities are meant to behave but like businesses, and in so doing, the defence of academic freedom is significantly weakened. Students have become customers, and customers are always right, and they have to attract their customers in a variety of ways. Consequently, universities are often afraid to take a stand that might damage their, or that they think might damage their reputation among potential student customers or make them unpopular with current students. So I call on universities and on you, my colleagues and friends, to support the right to express unpopular opinions, whatever your own views about self-identification and or the transitioning of children and young people. We need to reclaim the right to raise difficult questions and debate controversial subjects. The slogan, no debate, is neither appropriate nor acceptable in universities. I've argued that gender transition is a complex issue and we don't know enough about its long-term effects, especially in children and young people. For their sakes, university authorities should actively protest, protect the rights of scholars to study the complex desires and conditions associated with their children and their parents wanting to transition those children. I believe that such inquiry requires an understanding of the cultural work of identity, of the kind of conjuncture that we're in now in relation to gender and the relations of power between the sexes and between children and adults. So, a call to arms. A call to arms indeed. I cannot believe that Debbie's retiring because there's a lot of work for the next 70, 80, 100 years that needs to be done and we need academics like Debbie. But, but with her supervision and her leadership um, in this area, I think there are plenty more academics who are going to be generations to come and following from what, uh, what Debbie has taught us. Um, fabulous. I was so enthralled by that. I don't often get time, ch time to actually listen to academics speak and there aren't that many... There don't seem to be that many opportunities during the working day that we can do that. And thank you to all those uh, members of research centres who organise events for people to speak, because it's very important that we do hear each other and we do celebrate that. Um, it's traditional in an inaugural that we don't have questions, but this isn't an inaugural. It's a valedictory, so we can have questions. So Debbie's kindly said, if there are any questions, um, she's or happy to answer them. Contributions. Or contributions to the debate. Please feel free. That's put you on the spot because you weren't expecting any questions, were you? So um, have a think about that. If, if you do, I'll give you a, a, a couple of minutes. I mean, um, while you're thinking, my, I have three children who are 20, 23 and 25, uh, and I'm finding it incredibly difficult as a father to cope with their, the complexities of their lives. And I thought, I'm sure it wasn't that complex when I was, when I was that age. I probably was, but I was so into myself, um, I didn't know. But um, as a parent, it's really, it's, it's really, really important that, that your work carries on. And, and that last bit about the, the, the shutting down of the debate is something that I talk to my wife about a lot, because we find that we're just not allowed to even mention it. And I think it's really important that, that you raise that, that today. Questions? Now you've had a chance to think, while I thought of something. No one dares. Sue? I mean, you, you've raised so, so many difficult issues, and challenging that I really just wanted to ask whether you are optimistic. Well, like I said, <laughs> conjunctures, you can never, conjunctures are moments where change is possible and you never know which way it's going to go. So I wouldn't like to make a prediction, but I'm... I, I had a friend in Birmingham when I was doing the race, being a race advisor and doing my PhD, who was, was the first black haired in Birmingham. And I had him talk to my students one day, and someone asked him if he was an optimist or a pessimist. And he said, I'm not an optimist or a pessimist, I'm a realist. And I think, you know, from my point of view, what we have to do is try to make the debate go in the way we want it to, without resort to abuse or insults or threats of violence, all of which uh, gender-critical feminists, as we're now called, now have experienced. And, I mean, if you read that piece by, Ka by Kathleen Stock, which is in Medium, uh, and you see the 
anonymized comp accounts of what's happened. It's shocking. And certainly, you know, Rosa Friedman at Reading has been very public about what's happened to her, so I don't mind saying it. Uh, you know, she's had campaigns to get her sacked. She's, you know, it's absolutely appalling. And the threats of violence, there hasn't been much actual violence, but they're blood curdling. And very recently, I was going to put this in, but in the end, I couldn't, I didn't think I had enough time or space. Very recently, on the 12th of September, in fact, a young woman called Magdalene Burns, who was a vlogger, and she did, she was witty, incisive, um, and very, very critical of trans politics. And she had brain cancer, which was, has been known for some time. And when she went into palliative care, there were tweets celebrating her potential death, and then after she died, tweets celebrating her death at the age of 35. Well, you know, it's not okay. And I've had a number of people say to me, well, it's from both sides. But to be honest, the worst thing I've ever seen anyone gender critical say, you know, and, and sometimes they're not very nice, but they, you know, they, they might say, um, uh, you're, you're not a woman, you're a man. And this is then labeled transphobic and literal violence. Uh, so, you, you know, you don't have to transgress very far. And I fully would expect me to be labeled transphobic. And, and I have been blocked without having any direct engagements, because I don't do that, with anyone on Twitter. Um, but because I've signed a couple of letters, which have been published. Uh, there's a, an app called Turf Blocker, Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. Um, and I'm obviously on that list. You know, so. But on the other hand, times are changing. And, and you know, certainly in, the, in, in Scotland, there's been some. Uh, move towards uh, reconsidering some of it at least. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, I'm more ago, you mentioned me a couple of times Debbie, in your uh, speech. And I would say uh, there is no room for uh, pessimism. Um, we have to change this. There's an imperative to have change. The science of academics is terrible in itself, but the harms that are being done uh, to children and young people through the kind of unfettered um, push uh, of these ideological positions that Devon is critiquing are untenable, and we have to do what we can. Um, having said that, it's terrifying, and uh, we really need to speak instead of so together and have each other's backs in this. We cannot be afraid. And you can probably hear from my voice now, I am afraid. <laughs> but thank you, Debbie, for being your position. Thank you. Thank you. Antonia. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Jumping in. Debbie, I was just wondering, how, how do you think we could create a culture? Sorry. Sorry. to whatever stereotypes they're supposed to conform to always they tend to be other, that's true. But are afraid or not afraid? I think like I'm certainly not afraid now and haven't been for many years to say that I'm a 
place with him. Mm. Whereas, you know, I was afraid for quite a long time, partly because my children were young. And it was only when they got to the next due first, make them sure, um, that I felt I could be out and active in lesbian and gay politics um, without the danger of losing my children to the custody of their father. So, but I really have, one of the things that um, completely forgotten her name for me, and I know her really well. She was at the, at the Cultural Studies. Anyway, she, she wrote a piece about Section 28, Clause 28, and she, her sort of concluding phrase was, there's been nothing in the century that has promoted homosexuality as successfully as Clause 28. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are her, my words, not hers, but that's what she, she meant, because we were all there protesting. Completely forgotten the name. Do you know it more? No, I'm not sure. I don't know. Stacy, Jackie Stacy. Oh, right. In, in, in uh, off centre, famous cultural studies from the book from the Thank you. It's um, coming towards the end of our, our time. Um, th this is also, as well as being your fellow Dutch lecturer, it's a chance for us to say thank you and goodbye because this is your this is your leaving speech. Um, uh, I've been head of the department for three years here now, and um, I know that you've helped many researchers, many members of staff. You've helped me a lot because I had to really think about what I said when I was talking in front of you, Debbie, because you would tell me if, if that wasn't right, if I needed to. So, so my debating skills got better, and I really valued your advice. Uh, I think everybody who's, who's ever worked with you has valued that. Um, I know you're retiring, but there's no such thing as retiring, really, these days. Um, I've got to go, there's a card for you, but it's over there, so I've got to do that, but Sarah will present you with, with some flowers, and, and there's a gift as well. There we go. And there's, there's a card for you which um, it says, um, with a heavy heart and a tear in her eye, Debbie reluctantly said farewell to her life at the University of Rohan. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, Believe it if you can. There's a donation there as well. Thank there. you. It should be by email, but that's a physical representation of it. So Thank well you. done, Debbie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you everyone much. for coming. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you for recording it. We'll make it available to those who couldn't come in a private um, private way, so that it's only uh, any subscribers, only people who've asked for the URL, and you can distribute that as you want to. Okay. Lovely. Thank you for coming. Uh, please enjoy any more comestibles which are still there. Uh, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.